book the tenth chapter six of charlotte's inheritance this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by celine major charlotte's inheritance by mary elizabeth braden chapter six beyond the veil diana and her husband did not linger long at brighton they went back to town in time to see the last of that old wayfarer whose troubled journey came to so peaceful an ending it was a very calm haven in which this battered old privateer lay at anchor after life's tempestuous course but to the captain himself it seemed a hard thing that he should not have been permitted one brief cruise upon that summer sea which danced so gaily beneath the keel of the nanobs prosperous bark we have shared adversity my love he said sadly when he talked with his daughter in the last few days but your prosperity i am to have no share in well i suppose i have no right to complain my life has been an erring one but poverty is the most vicious companion that a man can consort with if i had come into six or seven thousand a year i might have been as starch in my notions as a bishop but i have been obliged to live diana that was the primary necessity and i learnt to accommodate myself to it that he had erred the captain was very ready to acknowledge that he had sinned deeply and had much need to repent himself of his iniquity he was very slow to perceive but sometimes in the still watches of the night when the faint lamplight on the shadowy wall was more gloomy than darkness when the nurse hired to assist his own man in these last days dozed in her comfortable chair the truth came home to his shallow soul and horatio paget knew that he had been indeed a sinner and very vile among sinners then for a moment the veil of self-deception was lifted and he saw his past life as it had really been selfish dishonourable cruel beyond measure in reckless injury of others for a moment the awful book was opened and the sinner saw the fearful sum set against his name what can wipe out the dread account he asked himself is there such a thing as forgiveness for a selfish useless life a life which is one long offence against god and man in these long wakeful nights the dying man thought much of his wife the sweet tender face came back to him with its mournful wondering look he knew now how his falsehoods and dishonours had wounded and oppressed that gentle soul he remembered how often she had pleaded for the right and how he had ridiculed her arguments and set at naught her tender pleadings he had fancied her in a manner inimical to himself when she urged the cause of some angry creditor or meek deluded landlady now with the light that is not upon earth or sea shining in the picture of his past career he could see and understand things as he had never seen or understood them before he knew now that it was for his own sake that faithful and devoted wife had pleaded his own interest that had been near to her pitying heart as well as the interest of bakers and butchers landladies and tailors she might have made a good man of me if i had let her have her way he thought to himself i know that she is in heaven will she plead for me i wonder at the foot of the great throne i used to laugh at her bad english or fly in a passion with her sometimes poor soul when i wanted her to pass for a lady and she broke down outrageously but there her voice will be heard when mine appeals in vain dear soul i wonder who taught her to be so pure and unselfish and trusting and faithful she was a christian without knowing it i thank thee o father lord of heaven and earth because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes he thought of his wife's lonely deathbed and compared it with his own for him there was luxury by him watched a devoted and all-forgiving daughter a generous friend and son-in-law all that could be done to soothe the painful descent was done for him for her there had been nothing but loneliness and sorrow but she might be certain of a speedy welcome in a better home thought horatio and i ah dear kind creature there the difference was all in her favour as the closing scene grew nearer he thought more and more of his gentle low-born wife whose hold upon him in life had been so slender 
whose memory had occupied until now so insignificant a place in his mind his daughter watched him unceasingly in the last two days and nights his mind wandered on the day of his death he mistook diana for that long-lost companion i have not been a kind husband mary my dear he faltered but the world has been hard upon me debts difficulties crack regiment expensive mess set of gamblers no pity on a young man without fortune force of example tied a millstone round my wretched neck before i was twenty-one years of age later when the doctor had felt his pulse for the last time he cried out suddenly i have made a statement of my affairs the liabilities are numerous the assets nil but i rely on the clemency of this court these were his last words he sank into a kind of stupor betwixt sleeping and waking and in this he died End of chapter six recorded by celine major book the tenth chapter seven of charlotte's inheritance this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by celine major charlotte's inheritance by mary elizabeth braden chapter seven better than gold the little fleet of paper boats which mr sheldon had pioneered so skilfully over the commercial seas came to grief very soon after the disappearance of the admiral a bill drawn upon the honduras mahogany company limited was the first to reach maturity the bill was referred to the drawer the drawer was not to be found i have not seen sheldon for the last fortnight mr orcott informed the gentleman who brought him the document out of business for a fortnight he has not been in business for a month his stepdaughter has been very ill a death's door and all that kind of thing and my governor was awfully cut up about it there used to be a couple of doctors at the house every day and no end of fuss i took sheldon his letters and managed matters for him here and so on and one fine morning my young lady runs off and gets married on the quiet so i suspect there was a good deal of shamming about the illness and those old fogies the doctors winked at it between them all i fancy sheldon was completely sold and he has turned savage and gone off somewhere in the sulks i wish he had chosen any other time for his sulks said the holder of the bill my partner and i have discounted several acceptances for him he gave us liberal terms and we considered any paper of his as safe as a bank of england note and now this confounded bill comes back to us through our bankers noted refer to drawer a most unpleasant thing you know and very inconsiderate of sheldon to leave us in such a fix he has forgotten the bill i suppose said mr orcott well but you see really now a business man ought not to forget that kind of thing and so miss halliday has made a runaway match has she i remember seeing her when i dined at bayswater an uncommonly fine girl and she has gone and thrown herself away upon some penniless scapegrace most likely now by the by how about this honduras company mr orcott they don't seem to have any london offices i believe not we've some of their prospectuses somewhere about i think would you like to see one i should very much mr orcott opened two or three drawers and after some little trouble produced the required document it was a very flourishing prospectus setting forth the enormous benefits to be derived by shareholders from the profitable dealings of the company some good high-sounding names figured in the list of directors and the chairman was captain h n acromy paget the prospectus looked well enough but the holder of mr sheldon's dishonoured bill was not able to derive much comfort from high-sounding phrases and high-sounding names i'll go down to bayswater and see if i can hear anything of your governor he said to mr orcott he was not there yesterday when i called and his servants could tell me nothing of his whereabouts the young yorkshireman said very coolly indeed cried the holder of the dishonoured bill in some alarm now really that is not right a business man ought not to do that kind of thing he called a cab and drove to the lawn there was the smart gothic villa with its pointed gables and florid chimneys and oriel windows and in the tudor casements of the ground floor appeared the bills of a west end auctioneer announcing in large letters that the lease of this charming mansion together with the nearly new furniture 
linen books china plate carefully selected proof prints after distinguished modern artists small seller of choice wines etc 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 would be disposed of by the auction on the following day mr sheldon's victim went into the house where he found some men preparing for the forthcoming sale what is the meaning of all this he asked aghast a bill of sale sir messrs naphtali and zabulon this was enough the holder of the bill went back to the city another bill came due on the following day and before the members of the stock exchange took their luncheon it was known that philip sheldon's credit was among the things of the past i always thought he was out of his depth said one set of talkers he was the last man i should have expected to see come to grief said another set of talkers on settling day came the awful proclamation philip sheldon had absconded and would not meet his differences on the same day came a terrible revelation to mr george sheldon of gray's inn solicitor genealogist and pedigree hunter the first official step in the advancement of gustave lenoble's claim against the crown was taken by messrs dashwood and vernon the solicitors of whitehall and george sheldon discovered that between charlotte hawkehurst and the haygarth estate there stood a prior claimant whereby all his toil trouble cost out of pocket and wear and tear of body and mind had been wasted it is enough to make a man go and cut his throat cried george in his first savage sense of utter disappointment he went into his slovenly bedroom and took out one of his razors and felt the corrugated surface of the left side of his neck meditatively but the razor was blunt and the corrugated surface seemed very tough and unmanageable so george sheldon decided that this kind of operation was an affair which might be deferred he heard the next day that his brother was non est and in his own phraseology that there was a pretty kettle of fish in the city upon my word phil and i seem to have brought our pigs to a very nice market he said i dare say wherever that fellow has gone he has carried a well-lined purse with him but i wouldn't have his conscience for all the wealth of the rothschilds it's bad enough to see tom halliday's face as i see it sometimes what must it be to him a little more than a year after this and the yellow corn was waving on the fertile plains of normandy fruit ripening in orchards on hillside and in valley merry holiday folks splashing and dabbling in the waves that wash the yellow sands of dieppe horses coming to grief in norman steeplechases desperate gamesters losing their francs and half francs in all kinds of frivolous games in the dieppe établissement and yonder in the heart of normandy beyond the tall steeples of rouen a happy family assembled at the chateau cotenoir one happy family two happy families rather but so closely united by the bonds of love and friendship as to seem indeed one here are gustave lenoble and his young wife diana with two tall slender damsels by their side and here is valentine hawkehurst the successful young scribbler with his fair young wife charlotte and out on the terrace yonder are two nurses walking with two babies at that early and to some minds obnoxious stage of babyhood in which a perpetual rocking and pacing to and fro and swaying backwards and forwards in the air is necessary for the preservation of anything approaching tranquillity but to the minds of the two young mothers and the two proud fathers these small creatures in their long white robes seemed something too bright for earth the united ages of the babies do not amount to six months but the mothers have counted every gradual stage of these young lives and to both it seems as if there has been no time in which the children were not with so firm a hold have they possessed themselves of every thought in the foolish maternal mind of every impulse in the weak maternal heart mrs hawkehurst has brought her son to see his aunt diana for diana has insisted upon assuming that relationship by letters patent as it were madame lenoble's baby is a daughter and this fact in itself seems to the two friends to be a special interposition of providence would it not be delightful if they should grow up to love each other and marry exclaimed diana and charlotte agreed with her that such an event in the future did indeed seem a manner foreshadowed by the conduct of the infants in the present he takes notice of her already she exclaimed looking out at the little creature in white muslin robes held up against the warm blue sky see they are cooing at each other i am sure that must be cooing 
and then the two mothers went out upon the sunny terrace walk and fondly contemplated these domestic treasures until the domestic treasures were seized with some of the inexplicable throes and mysterious agonies of early babyhood and had to be borne off shrieking to their nurseries dear angel said gustave of his little last one she has the very shriek of clarice here poignant and penetrating until to drown the heart dost thou figure to thyself that thy voice was penetrating as that my beautiful in the time he kissed his beautiful and she ran off to join the procession following the two babies alarmed nurses distracted mammas shrieking infants anxious damsels c'est un vrai tourbillon as gustave remarked to his companion valentine hawkehurst these women how they love their children what of saints what of madonnas what of angels whereupon he spouted victor hugo lorsque l'enfant paraît le cercle de famille applaudit à grands cris son doux regard qui brille fait briller tous les yeux et les plus tristes fronts les plus souillés peut-être se dérident soudain à voir l'enfant paraître innocent et joyeux all things had gone well for m de noble his direct descent from matthew haygarth the father of the intestate had been proved to the satisfaction of crown lawyers and high court of chancery and he had been in due course placed in possession of the reverend intestate's estate to the profit and pleasure of his solicitors and m fleury and to the unspeakable aggravation of george sheldon who washed his hands at once and for ever of all genealogical research and fell back in an embittered and angry spirit upon the smaller profits to be derived from petty transactions in the bill discounting line and a championship of penniless sufferers of all classes from a damsel who considered herself jilted by a fickle swain in proof of whose inconstancy she could produce documentary evidence of the pork-chop and tomato-sauce order to a pedestrian who knocked his head against a projecting shutter in the strand and straightway walked home to holloway to lay himself up for a twelve month in a state of mental and bodily incapacity requiring large pecuniary redress from the owner of the fatal shutter to this noble protection of the rights of the weak did george sheldon devote his intellect and when malicious enemies stigmatized these quixotic endeavors as speculative actions or when in the breaking down of some oppressed damsels caused by reason of the slender evidence afforded by some reticent lover's epistolary effusions unjust judges told him that he ought to be ashamed of himself for bringing such an action the generous attorney no doubt took consolation from an approving conscience and went forth from that court to look for other oppressed damsels or injured wayfarers erect and unshaken some little profit mr sheldon of gray's inn did derive from the haygarth estate for at the request of gustave lenoble messrs dashwood and vernon sent him a cheque for one thousand pounds as the price of those early investigations which had set the artful captain upon the right track he wrote a ceremoniously grateful letter to gustave lenoble on receiving this honorarium it is always well to be grateful for benefits received from a rich man but in the depths of his heart he execrated the fortunate inheritor of the haygarthian thousands mr hawkehurst was not quite so vehement in the expression of his feelings as that lively celt gustave but deep in his heart there was a sense of happiness no less pure and exalted providence had given him more than he had ever dared to hope not john haygarth's thousands not a life of luxurious idleness and dinner-giving and derby days and boxes on the grand tier and carriage horses at five hundred guineas a pair not a palace in belgravia and a shooting-box in the highlands and a villa at cowes not these things in which he would once have perceived the summum bonum but a fair price for his labour a dear young wife a tranquil home nor had his researches among the dusty records of the departed haygarths been profitless in a pecuniary sense to himself gustave lenoble insisted that he should accept the honorarium of three thousand pounds which had been promised by george sheldon as the reward of his success captain paget would never have been put on the right track if he had not filched your secrets from you said the son and heir of susan meynell it is to your researches in the first place that i owe this inheritance and you cannot refuse to accept the agreed price of your labour valentine did not refuse this fairly earned reward nor did he oppose the settlement which gustave made in favour of charlotte's infant son it seemed to him only just that some share of the heritage should fall to the descendant of poor susan's younger sister and faithful friend with this capital of three thousand pounds comfortably invested in consuls 
and with the interest of that sum of ten thousand pounds settled on his infant son mr hawkehurst began the world in his new character of a husband and a father very pleasantly of his literary career very little need be said here he was yet at the beginning of the long dusty road that leads to the temple of fame it is enough to state that he found the dusty high road rather difficult walking and that he was pelted with more mud flung by nameless assailants hidden behind the hedges than he had anticipated when he set out upon the first stage of his journey happily he found pleasant fellow-travellers and kindly encouragement from an indulgent public and was thus able to accept the mud which bespattered his garments in a very placid spirit and to make light of all obstacles in the great highway the cottage at wimbledon was no longer a dream it was a pleasant reality the pride and delight of mrs sheldon and anne woolper it was a picturesque dwelling-place half cottage half villa situated on the broad high road from london to kingston with all the woodland of richmond park to be seen from the windows at the back only a wall divided mr hawkehurst's gardens from the coverts of the queen it was like a royal domain charlotte said whereupon her husband insisted that it should be christened by the name of a royal dwelling and so called it charlottenburg mr hawkehurst had secured his delightful abode for a considerable term of years and upon the furnishing and decoration of the pretty rustic rooms charlotte and he lavished unmeasured care the delicious excitement of picking up or in more elegant parlance collecting was to these two happy people an inexhaustible source of pleasure every eccentric little table every luxurious chair had its special history and had been the subject of negotiation and diplomacy that might have sufficed a burleigh in the reorganization of western europe the little dresden and vienna cups and saucers in the maple cabinet had been every one bought from a different dealer the figures on the mantelpiece were old chelsea of a quality that would have excited the envy of a bernal or a bon and had only fallen to the proud possessors by a sequence of fortuitous circumstances the history of which was almost as thrilling as the story of bonner's diamond necklace the curtains in the drawing-room had draped the portiere of the lovely lady blessington and had been bought for a song by valentine hawkehurst after passing through the hands of brokers and dealers innumerable the tapestry-covered louis quatorze chairs had belonged to madame de sévigné and had furnished that dull country house whence she wrote the liveliest letters extant to her disreputable cousin bussy count of Babutin these inestimable treasures had been picked up by mr and mrs hawkehurst from a bric-a-brac merchant in a little court at the back of la rue vivienne whither the young couple had gone arm in arm to choose a bonnet on their first pleasure trip to paris the clock in the modest dining-room had been secured from the repository of the same merchant and was warranted to have sounded the last domestic hours of maximilien robespierre in his humble lodging chez le menuisier the inkstand into which mr hawkehurst dipped his rapid pen had served the literary career of voltaire the blotting-book on which he wrote had been used by balzac to the plausible fictions of the second-hand dealer mr and mrs hawkehurst lent willing ears and it seemed to them as if these associations for which they had paid somewhat dearly imparted a new grace to their home the arrangement and superintendence of all these treasures gave poor georgie endless pleasure and employment but in her heart of hearts she believed in the prim splendours of the dismantled lawn as much superior to these second-hand objects of art and upholstery nor did anne woolper regard the chelsea figures and dresden teacups and old black albert duret engravings as anything better than an innocent eccentricity on the part of the master of the house for the saving of whose purse she managed and economized as faithfully as she had done for that lost master whereof the memory was so bitter it will be seen therefore that mr hawkehurst with a wife a mother-in-law and a faithful old servant was likely to be well taken care of a little spoiled perhaps by much cherishing but carefully guarded from all those temptations which are supposed to assail the bachelor man of letters toiling alone and neglected in temple chambers for him the days passed in a pleasant monotony of constant labour lightened always by the thought of those for whom he worked cheered ever by the fond hope of future fame he was no longer a bookmaker he had written a book the proceeds of which had enabled him to furnish the wimbledon villa and he was engaged in writing a second book the fruits whereof would secure the needs of the immediate future he had insured his life for a considerable amount 
and had shown himself in all things prudent to a degree that verged upon philistinism but the policies taken out on charlotte's life by mr sheldon had been suffered to lapse valentine would have no money staked on that dear head the steed which charlotte had desired for her husband's pleasure the library which she had catalogued so often were yet among the delights of the future but life has lost half its brightness when there is no unfulfilled desire left to the dreamer and the horse which mr hawkehurst was to ride in time to come and the noble library which he was to collect were the pleasant themes of charlotte's conversation very often as she and her husband walked on the heights of wimbledon in the twilight when his day's work was done these twilight walks were the happy holidays of his life and a part of his liberal education he told his wife everything every literary scheme every fancy every shadowy outline of future work every new discovery in the boundless realms of bookland his enthusiasm his hero-worship his setting up of one favourite and knocking down of another his unchristian pleasure in that awful slating of poor jones in this week's saturday or the flaying alive of robinson in the bond street backbiter in a word his shop never became wearisome to charlotte she listened always with a like rapture and sympathy she worshipped his favourites of bookland she welcomed his friends and fellow-workers with unvarying sweetness she devised and superintended the fitting up of a smoking-room that was perfectly paradisical a glimpse of the alhambra in miniature and that obnoxious dish the cold shoulder was never served in mr hawkehurst's dwelling so sweet a wife so pleasant a home popularized the institution of matrimony among the young writer's bachelor friends and that much abused and cruelly maligned member of the human race the mother-in-law was almost rehabilitated by mrs sheldon's easy good nature and evident regard for the interests of her daughter's husband and after all the groping among dry as dust records of a bygone century after all the patient following of those faint traces on the sands of time left by the feet of matthew haygarth this was charlotte's inheritance a heart whose innocence and affection made home a kind of earthly paradise and gave to life's commonest things a charm that all the gold ever found in california could not have imparted to them this was charlotte's inheritance the tender unselfish nature of the haygarths and hallidays and thus dowered her husband would not have exchanged her for the wealthiest heiress whose marriage was ever chronicled in court circular or court journal end of chapter seven read by celine major book the tenth chapter eight of charlotte's inheritance this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by celine major charlotte's inheritance by mary elizabeth Braden. chapter eight lost sight of a year and a half had passed since the disappearance of philip sheldon from the circle in which he had been considered a person of some importance the repudiation of those bills by which he had sustained his exhausted credit or rather the discovery that the companies upon which the bills pretended to be drawn were of all shadows the most shadowy had brought consternation upon many and ruin upon some bitter and unmeasured were the terms in which city men spoke of that phil sheldon with whom they had eaten the sacred bait and quaffed the social moselle in the taverns of greenwich and blackwall there is a saying current on the stock exchange to the effect that the man who fails and disappears from his fellows behind a curtain of commercial cloud is sure to return sooner or later to his old circle with a moustache and a brougham for philip sheldon there was however no coming back the moustache and the brougham of the chastened and penitent defaulter were not for him by his deliberate and notorious dishonour he had shut the door against the possibility of return it may be supposed that the defaulter knew this for he did not come back and since he had no lack of moral courage he would scarcely have refrained from showing himself once more in his old haunts if it had been possible for him to face the difficulties of his position time passed and there came no tidings of the missing man though a detective was dispatched to america in search of him by one vengeful sufferer among the many victims of the fictitious bills of exchange it was supposed that he must inevitably go to america and thither went his pursuer 
but with no result except the expenditure of money and the further exasperation of the vengeful sufferer what will you do with him if you get him asked a philosophical friend of the sufferer he has nothing to surrender zabulon had a bill of sale on his furniture furniture cried the infuriated victim i don't want his furniture i want his flesh and bones i want to shut him up in dartmoor prison or to get him twenty years hard labour at portland island that sort of man would get a ticket of leave in less than twelve months replied the philosophic friend i'm afraid you are only throwing good money after bad the event proved this gentleman but too able a seer in the monster city of new york philip sheldon had disappeared like a single drop of water flung upon the atlantic ocean there was no trace of him too intangible for the grasp of international law he melted into the mass of humanity only one struggler the more in the great army perpetually fighting life's desperate battle from among all those who had known him this man had utterly vanished and not one sigh of regret followed him in his unknown wanderings not one creature amongst all those who had taken his hand and given him friendly greeting thought of him kindly or cared to know whither he went or how he prospered he had not left in the house that had sheltered him for years so much as a dog to whine at his door or listen for his returning footstep this fact if he had known it or considered it would have troubled him very little he had played his game for a certain stake and had lost it this he felt and cursed his own too cautious play as the cause of his defeat that there were higher stakes for which he might have played an easier game was a fact that never occurred to him in his philosophy there was indeed nothing higher given to the hopes of man than worldly success and a dull cold prosperous life spent among prosperous acquaintance he was gone and those who remembered him most keenly valentine hawkehurst diana paget and wilper remembered him with a shudder the old yorkshire woman thought of him sometimes as she bent over the little muslin bedecked cradle where the hope of the hawkehurst slumbered and looked round fearfully in the gloaming half expecting to see his dreaded face glower upon her dark and threatening from between the curtains of the window it was a belief of all ancient races nay indeed a belief still current amongst modern nations that it is not given to man to behold the beings of another world and live the arab who meets a phantom in the desert goes home to his tent to die he knows that the hand of doom is upon him he has seen that upon which for mortal eyes it is fatal to look and it is thus in some measure with those who are admitted within the dark precincts of murder's dread sanctuary not swiftly does the curtain fall which has once been lifted from the hidden horrors of that ghastly temple the revelations of an utterly wicked soul leave a lasting impress upon the mind which unwillingly becomes recipient of those awful secrets the circumstances of tom halliday's death and of charlotte's illness were not to be forgotten by anne woolper the shadow of that dark cruel face which had lain upon her bosom for forty years before haunted many a peaceful hour of her quiet old age her ignorance and that faint tinge of superstition which generally accompanies ignorance exaggerated the terror of those dark memories the thought that philip sheldon still lived still had the power to plot and plan evil against the innocent was an ever-present source of terror for her she could not understand that such an element could exist among the forces of evil without fatal result to some one it seemed to her as if a devil were at large and there could be neither peace nor security until the evil spirit was exercised the baneful presence laid in nethermost depths of unfathomable sea these feelings and these fears would scarcely have arisen in the old woman's breast had she alone been subject to the possible plottings of that evil nature for herself she had little fear her span of life was nearly ended very few were the sands that had yet to run and for her own sake she would have cared little if some rough hand had spilt them untimely but a new interest in life had been given to mrs woolper just as life drew near its close that peerless child the son and heir of the hawkehursts had been entrusted to the old woman's care and this infant she loved with an affection much more intense than that which had once made philip sheldon so dear to her 
it was by the cradle of this much treasured child that ann wolper nursed her fear of her old master she knew that he had been counter-plotted and beaten ignominiously in that deadly game which he had played so boldly and she asked herself whether he was the man to submit to such utter defeat without any effort to revenge himself upon those who had helped to compass his failure on that night when charlotte halliday had lain between life and death suffering on the one hand from the effects of a prolonged and gradual course of poison on the other from the violent measures taken to eliminate that poisonous element from her system on that night when the precious life yet trembled in the balance ann wolper had seen murderous looks in the face of the man whom she dared boldly to defy and who knew in that hour that his ghastly plot was discovered even now secure in a haven of safety she could not forget that baneful look in philip sheldon's eyes she could not find perfect rest while she knew not where that man might be or what mischief he might be plotting against those she loved her fears showed themselves in many ways when she read of dark and vengeful deeds in her newspaper she thought of her old master and how in such or such an act his fatal hand might reveal itself he might lie in wait for valentine some night on the dark road between charlottenborough and the distant railway station she could fancy the young wife's agony of terror as the night wore on and her husband did not return the unspeakable horror that would come over all that happy household when the news came that its young master had been found on the lonely road slain by some unknown hand open utterance to her fears she was too wise to give but she warned mr hawkehurst of the dangers on that dark road and besought him to arm himself with a trusty bludgeon wherewith to meet and vanquish any chance assailant valentine laughed at her anxious warning but when charlotte took up the cry he was fain to content her by the purchase of a sturdy stick which he swung cheerily to and fro as he walked homewards in the gloaming planning a chapter in his new book and composing powerful and eloquent sentences which eluded his mental grasp when he tried to reduce his evening reverie to pen and ink when the air blows fresh across the common and the distant lights twinkle and the bright stars peep out in the pale yellow sky my language flows as it never does when i sit at my desk lotta he said to his wife i feel myself the swift or a genius out there equal to the tackling of any social question that ever arose upon this earth from the wood half fence to the policy of the american taxation and triennial elections at home i am only valentine hawkehurst with an ever-present consciousness that so many pages of copy are required from me within a given time and that my son and heir is cutting his teeth and making more fuss about it than i ever made about my teeth and that the man about the water rate is waiting to see me please and is desperately anxious about making up his books and that i have the dearest wife in christendom who opens my door and puts her pretty head into my room once in half an hour to see how i am getting on or to ask whether i want any more coals or to borrow my ink to make up her washing-book you mean sir that i prevent your becoming a genius cried charlotte with an enchanting moo yes dear i begin to understand why swift kept his poor ill-used wife at a respectful distance she would have made him too happy if he had allowed her to be on the premises she would have given the cruel indignation no chance of lacerating his heart and such writing as swift's is only produced by a man whose heart is so lacerated no my darling i shall never be a swift or a junius while your pretty head is thrust into my room once or twice an hour but i may hope to be something better if bright eyes can inspire bright thoughts and innocent smiles give birth to pleasant fancies upon this there was the usual little demonstration of affection between this young couple and charlotte praised her husband as the most brilliant and admirable of men after which pleasing flattery she favoured him with a little interesting information about the baby's last tooth and the contumacious behaviour of the new housemaid between whom and mrs woolper there had been a species of disagreement which the yorkshire woman described as a stand further thus occupied in simple pleasures and simple cares the lives of mr and mrs hawkehurst went on untroubled by any fear of that crime-burdened wretch whose image haunted the dreams and meditations of ann woolper for these two mr sheldon was numbered among the dead to charlotte 
the actual truth had never been revealed but she had been in the course of time given to understand that her stepfather had committed some unpardonable sin which must for ever separate him from herself and her mother she had been told as much as this and had been told that she must seek to know no more to this she submitted without questioning i am very sorry for him she said and for mamma she concluded that the unpardonable offence must needs have been some sin against her mother some long hidden infidelity brought suddenly to light with all the treachery and falsehood involved therein she never mentioned her stepfather after this but in her prayers the sinner was not forgotten End of chapter eight read by celine major book the tenth chapter nine of charlotte's inheritance this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by celine major charlotte's inheritance by mary elizabeth braden chapter nine eteocles and polynices george sheldon went his ways picking up as good a living as he could from that chivalrous assertion of the rights of the weak which has been already described and the thought of his brother's sin-burdened soul troubled him very little he did think of tom halliday for that last grasp of the honest yorkshire man's hand that last look in his old friend's face were haunting memories which this sharp practitioner had found himself powerless to exercise if his brother after an absence of many years in the remote regions of the east indies had come home to his fatherland with a colossal fortune and the reputation of having strangled a few natives during the process of amassing that fortune george sheldon would have welcomed the returning wanderer and would in his own parlance have swallowed the natives a few niggers more or less sent untimely to gehenna would have seemed scarcely sufficient cause for quarrel with a fraternal and liberally disposed millionaire but the circumstances of tom halliday's death had brought all the horror of crime and treachery home to the spectator of that deliberate assassination and had produced such an impression as no other circumstances could on so hard a nature it was some satisfaction to george sheldon to know that his old friend's daughter had found a happy home and he was apt to take some credit for his own share in his brother's discomfiture he met valentine sometimes in the course of his peregrinations in the neighbourhood of the british museum and the greeting between the two men was sufficiently cordial but mr hawkehurst did not invite his old employer to charlottenborough and george was able to comprehend that to that household no one bearing the name of sheldon could be a welcome visitor he jogged on comfortably enough in his own way living in his chambers and consorting with a few chosen friends and kindred spirits of the jolly good fellow class whom he met at an old established tavern in the west central district and in whose society and the society of the subscription ground in the farringdon road he found the summum bonum in the way of social intercourse he did a little speculation upon the turf and discounted the bills of needy bookmakers or bought up their bad debts and thereby gained introductions to the noble patrons of the humble scums and pushed his business into new grooves he had no idea that such an existence was in any way ignoble nay indeed when he had paid his rent and his clerk and his laundress and his tavern score and stood glasses round amongst his friends he lighted his cigar and thrust his hands into the depths of his pockets and paced the flags of holborn happy in the belief that he had performed the whole duty of man there are men whose business obliges them to keep up an establishment and go to church twice a day and all that kind of thing he said and i dare say they find it pay my clients don't care a doit why i live and how i spend my sundays and i'd rather have five pounds a week and my liberty than the best family connection in the fields the fate of that wretched man who had dropped out of his old circle and vanished no one knew whither in no manner disturbed the peace of george sheldon take my word for it that gentleman has fallen on his feet he said on the only occasion when the fate of philip was discussed by valentine and himself he's doing well enough somewhere or other you may depend but i don't think he'll ever be able to show his nose in london after those bill transactions there's a very strong feeling against him on change he's looked upon as a discredit to the order and that sort of thing you see it isn't often a member of the house goes to the bad like that 
no i don't think phil will ever show himself in london again but such a man as that can always find a platform somewhere and go on to the end of his days unpunished i suppose remarked mr hawkehurst with some bitterness well yes i don't see what's to touch him in the future of course he could be dropped upon for those bills if he came in the way of being dropped upon but as i said before he's too deep a card for that thus did george sheldon dismiss the subject that his brother was an exile for life from his native land he did not doubt but he took it for granted that in whatever distant spot of earth philip had found a refuge he would there contrive to prosper and to show a bold front in the city of his adoption this belief mr sheldon of gray's inn cherished until one snowy christmas eve a year and a half after that event or series of events which the lawyer briefly designated the burst up at bayswater bleak and bitter was that december a december not long gone by the heart of the prosperous british nation melted as the heart of one man the columns of the zeus and diurnal hermes the flag and the hesper overflowed with the record of subscriptions to charity funds and the leaders of the morning journals all preached the same kindly sermon on the same christian text thick lay the snow upon the housetops thick and slab the greasy slush upon the pavements of crowded thoroughfares merry the rogues and ragamuffins of the great city the ideal christmas of our dreams seemed to have come at last and the heart of every true briton rejoiced while skaters in the parks made merry and cabmen demanded fabulous sums of helpless wayfarers and luckless overworked underfed horses stumbled and fell at every turn and the familiar steep of holborn was dangerous as alpine mountain to george sheldon neither the weather nor the christmas season made much difference the ever current of his life was little disturbed by festive pleasures or dissipations an extra glass at his tavern an invitation to dinner from some friend in the bill discounting line were the most exciting events the season was likely to bring him he saw the shops brighten suddenly with semi-supernal glories of crystallized fruits and gorgeous bonbon boxes and he was aware of a kind of movement in the streets that was brisker and gayer than the plodding hurry of everyday life he stood aside and let the mummeries go by him and was glad when these christmas follies were done with and the law courts in full swing once more in the happiest and most innocent days of his youth christmas had brought him no more than extraordinary indulgences in the way of eating and drinking swiftly followed by that dread avenger the demon of the bilious upon this particular occasion mr sheldon had pledged himself to dine with a horsey publican lately retired from business and big with all the pride and glory of a place at hornsey come down and see my place sheldon this gentleman had said i don't pretend to do the swell thing but i force my own pines and grow my own grapes and can put as good a dessert on my table as you could buy in covent garden for a five pun note that's my missus fad that is and i can afford it so why shouldn't i do it you come and eat your christmas dinner with us sheldon i've got a friend coming that can sing as good a song as reeves hisself and might make a fortune if he wasn't above coming out at one of them music halls and i'll give you a bottle of madeira that you won't match at any nobleman's table if nobleman's tables was in your line of business which you and i know they ain't old fellow and then the jolly good fellow dug his fat fingers into george sheldon's ribs and george accepted the invitation not with any elation of spirits but sufficiently pleased to secure a good dinner with a man who promised to be a profitable client and whose house was within a reasonable cab fare from the west central district the cabmen are trying it on anyhow just now thought mr sheldon but i don't think they'll try it on with me and if they do there's the marylebone stage i'm not afraid of a five-mile walk having accepted this invitation and thus disposed of his christmas day george sheldon refrained from the delights of social converse at his tavern on christmas eve and occupied himself with business his clerk left him at the usual hour but the master sat long after dark writing letters and reading law papers while the snow drifted against his windows and whitened the quiet quadrangle below he had just laid aside his papers and lighted a cigar when he was startled by a stealthy knocking at his door he was not unaccustomed to late visitors as he was known to live at his chambers 
and to work after office hours but the knocking of to-night was not the loud rollicking rat-a-tat of his jolly good fellow-friends or clients if he had been a student of light literature and imbued with the ghostly associations of the season he would have gone to his door expecting to behold a weird figure clothed in the vestments of the last century or an old woman in ruff and martingale whose figure in the flesh had once haunted those legal precincts or the ghostly semblance of the baron of verulam himself revisiting the glimpses of the moon and the avenue of elms that were planted by his order in george sheldon's nature there was however no lurking dread of fiend or phantom his ideas in connection with ghosts were limited to a white sheet a broomstick and a hollow turnip with a lighted candle inside it and he would have set down the most awful apparition that ever was revealed to german ghost seer with a scornful grin as a member of the sheet and hollow turnip confraternity i know how it's done he would have said if the spectral form had glowered upon him in midnight churchyard or ruined abbey you'd better go and try it on somewhere else my friend to a superstitious mind the thing which crept across the dark lobby and dragged itself into the glare of the gas-lighted office might have seemed indeed some creature too loathsome for humanity a plague-stricken corpse galvanized into a spasmodic life could scarcely have lifted to the light a more awful countenance than that on which george sheldon looked with mingled anger and disgust what do you want here he asked do you take this for the workhouse no the creature answered in a faint hoarse voice but i take you for my brother what cried george sheldon aghast he bent down and looked at the awful face yes from the cavernous hollows of those sunken cheeks beneath the shaggy penthouse of those bony brows the fierce black eyes of philip sheldon looked out at him with a savage glare that he had never seen in them before even when the savage nature of the man had revealed itself most nakedly the fierce glare of fever and starvation this walking horror this mass of loathsome rags endued with motion this living disease was the sometime prosperous stockbroker the man whom it had been impossible to think of except furnished with linen of spotless whiteness and the glossy broadcloth and well-made boots and keyless chronometer and silk umbrella of commercial success good god exclaimed george horror-stricken is it you yes it's i answered the creature in his strange husky accents and the change nay indeed the degradation of the voice was as complete as the degradation of the man yes george it's i your brother phil you're surprised to see me fallen so low in the world i suppose but you can't be more surprised than i am myself i've tried hard enough to hold my head above water there's scarcely any trade that mortal man ever tried to earn his bread by that i haven't tried and failed in it has been the experience of this george street over and over again in every trade and every profession i started as doctor in philadelphia and was doing well till till a patient died and things went against me i've been clerk in more offices than you can count on your ten fingers but there was always something my employer levanted or was bankrupt or died or dismissed me i've been travelling dentist auctioneer commission agent tout peddler out yonder but it all came to the same thing ruin starvation the hospital or the pauper's ward i have swept crossings in the city and camped out in the wilderness among the bears and opossums one day i thought i'd come home there's george i said to myself if i can get money enough to take me across the atlantic i shall be all right george will give me a lift i don't stand alone in the world a man's own flesh and blood won't let him starve can't let him starve blood's thicker than water you know george so i came home i got the money never you mind how i needn't tell you what it cost me to scrape half a dozen pounds together when a man's as low down in the world as i am there's not a shilling he earns that doesn't cost him a drop of his heart's blood there's not a pound he gets together that isn't bought by the discount of so much of his life 
i found money enough for my passage in an immigrant vessel and here i am ready for anything i'll work like your bought nigger i'll do the work your clerk does for a quarter of his wages i'll sweep out your office and run errands for you you'll give me something to keep body and soul together won't you george nothing could be more utterly abject than the tone of this most abject wretch this man who in prosperity had been the very personification of hardness and insolence was transformed into a grovelling cringing supplicant ready to lie face downward in the dust beneath the feet of that brother whose patronage or charity he besought mr sheldon the younger contemplated the supplicant with looks of undisguised gratification he walked a few paces backward from the spot where his brother had fallen in a half-sitting half-crouching attitude and where he remained hugging himself in his rags too abject to be acutely conscious of his degradation a year ago and he would have held himself obstinately aloof from all old associations and would have declared himself ready to face starvation rather than accept still less supplicate relief from his younger brother the events of that one year had involved alternations and convulsions that change a year into a cycle he had faced starvation he had walked with hunger for his travelling companion he had lain down night after night in such lairs as a tramp can find for his refuge with sickness and pain for his bedfellows the crucible through which he had passed had left him in no more of humanity than its outward semblance and scarcely that for when the moral man sinks to the level of the beasts of prey the physical man undergoes an assimilative process only less marked than that which transforms the mental nature for six months this man had lived by fawning upon or threatening his fellow-men by violence or craft by the degradation of the vagrant or the audacity of the thief there is no limit to man's capacity for infamy which he had not touched vilest amongst the vile he had been cast forth from the haunts of beggars and reprobates as no fitting company for honourable thieves or cadgers of good repute george sheldon seated himself astride upon a chair and with his folded arms resting on the back of it contemplated this hideous spectacle it was a picture that he had never thought to see and the feeling with which he surveyed it was not unmingled with pleasure when you rode me roughshod my friend i used to think how i should enjoy taking my change out of you he said but i never thought i should have such an opportunity as this never by jove i thought you would ride the high horse to the end of the journey i didn't think your steed would land you in the gutter and so you've tried every move have you tumbled upon every platform and you found all your cleverness no go upon the other side of the three thousand miles of everlasting wet as my yankee friends call the atlantic and you've come back whining to me and i'm to help you am i and to give you a fresh start in life i suppose and make you my clerk or my junior partner eh that would be better messrs sheldon and sheldon wouldn't look bad on my door that's about what you mean when you talk of blood being thicker than water isn't it the abject wretch who had once been philip sheldon felt that his brother was trifling with him savouring to the last drop that cup of triumph which the chances of fortune had offered to his lips don't play the fool with me george he said piteously i don't ask you much a crust of bread a corner to sleep in and a cast-off suit of clothes that's not much for one brother to ask of another perhaps not replied george sheldon but it's a great deal for you to ask of me you've had your turn phil and you made the most of it and contrived to keep me at arm's length my turn has come at last and you may depend upon it i shall contrive now to keep you at arm's length the vagrant stared at him aghast here he had felt secure of food and shelter and he had endured miseries and deprivations that reduce a man to a state in which food and shelter seem to constitute the supreme good that can be obtained in this life you won't refuse to do something for me george he whined piteously i will do nothing for you do you hear that my man nothing you taught me that blood is not thicker than water twelve years ago when you married tom halliday's widow 
and drew your purse-strings after flinging me a beggarly hundred as you'd throw a bone to a dog you made me understand that was all i should ever get out of your brotherly love or your fear of my telling the world what i knew you gave me a dinner now and then because it suited you to keep your eye upon me and you had generally some piece of dirty work on hand that made the advice of a sharp practitioner like me uncommonly useful to you i don't believe that you ever gave me so much as a dinner that you didn't take payment for in meal or in malt don't come howling here now trying to persuade me that blood is thicker than water or that brotherhood means anything more than the accident of birth and now i've said all i have to say and the sooner you make yourself scarce the better for both of us george cried the miserable suppliant clasping his bony hands convulsively and whimpering as he had whimpered when he begged his bread in the streets of new york you can't mean to turn me out of doors on such a night look at me it was as much as i could do to crawl to this room i have walked every step of the way from liverpool my wretched limbs have been frost-bitten and ulcered and bruised and racked with rheumatism and bent double with cramp i came over in an immigrant vessel with a herd of miserable creatures who had tried their luck on the other side of the atlantic and had failed like me and were coming home to their native workhouses you don't know what some of your immigrant ships are perhaps people talk about the black hole of calcutta and the middle passage but let them try the cabin of an immigrant vessel and they'll have a pretty fair idea of what human beings have to suffer when poverty drives the ship i landed in liverpool with half a dollar in my pocket and i've had neither decent food nor decent shelter since i landed give me some hole to lie in george till you can get me an order for the nearest hospital it's a toss-up whether i ever come out of it do you think i'd sleep under the roof that sheltered you cried george why not why not because i'm afraid of you because i'd as soon have a cobra for my companion or a wolf for my bedfellow i know you i've seen what you can do and how you can do it and if you could do those things when the only pressure upon you was one that you could have cast off by going through the gazette what would you not do now when you are as desperate as a famished wolf and governed by no better law than that which governs a wolf the law of self-preservation am i to trust a tiger because he tells me he is hungry no phil sheldon neither will i trust you you will give me some money enough to keep me alive for a week or two not one sixpence i'll establish no precedent i'll acknowledge no tie between us you'd better march i don't want to send for a policeman but if you won't go quietly you must do the other thing you mean that most emphatically yes i didn't think it was in you to be so hard upon me faltered the wretch in that faint hoarse voice which had grown fainter and hoarser during his interview do you think that i would trust you cried george trust you you call me hard because i won't give you a corner to lie in and if i did you would creep out of your corner to poison me or cut my throat you would crawl into my room in the dead of the night and put a pillow over my face and kneel upon it till you've done the trick for me and then you'd walk off with as much as you could carry and begin the same kind of work over again with someone else i tell you mr phil sheldon i will hold no intercourse with you you've escaped hanging but there's something that's worse than hanging to my mind and that is the state of a man whom nobody will trust you've come to that and if you had a spark of gentlemanly feeling you'd have bought two penny worth of rope and hung yourself rather than come cringing to me suppose i don't cringe said the outcast dropping the fawning tone of the mendicant for the threatening ferocity of the social wolf you'd better give me a trifle to keep body and soul together for the next few weeks i'm a desperate man george you and i are alone up here you are pretty sure to have ready money about you and there's your watch 
that's worth something i didn't come here to go away empty-handed and i won't he sprang to his feet and in the next moment the lawyer heard the sharp clicking noise made by the opening of a clasp knife oh cried he that's what you want is it he bent over his desk with his eyes fixed on those other evil eyes that still retained some likeness to his own and with his left arm raised in a boxer's defence attitude to guard his head while his right hand groped for something in a drawer it was a moment's work philip had seized that uplifted left arm and was hanging on to it like a cat with his knife between his teeth when george clapped the muzzle of a revolver to his brow there are plenty of wild beasts in london besides you he said and i am not such a fool as to be without the means of settling a chance visitor of your sort drop your knife and march the outcast dropped his knife submissively he was too weak for anything more than a spasmodic violence take your pistol away from my head he whined certainly when you are outside my door you might give me a handful of silver george i haven't a week's life left in me all the better for society if you hadn't an hour's life in you be off i'm tired of holding this revolver to your head and i don't mean to let it go till you're off my premises philip saw that there was no hope food and shelter were all he had hoped for but even these blessings were not for him he backed out of the office closely followed by george holding the muzzle of the revolver within an inch or so of the fraternal brains upon the threshold only did he pause tell me one thing he said you won't give me a sixpence to buy a loaf of bread or a glass of gin give me one scrap of comfort it need cost you nothing tell me something bad of valentine hawkehurst that he's gone to the dogs or drowned himself that his wife has run away from him or his house has been burned to the ground tell me that he's had a taste of my luck and that anne wilfer has died in a workhouse it will be as good as meat and drink to me and it will cost you nothing if i told you anything of the kind i should tell you a lie valentine hawkers is doing uncommonly well and has got one of the prettiest little boxes between wimbledon and kingston ann wilper lives with them and is in better feather than she ever was in your time with this mr sheldon of gray's inn pushed his brother out on to the staircase and shut his door philip sat upon the stairs and drew his rags together a little and rubbed his wretched limbs while the bolts and chains whereby the lawyer defended his citadel clanked close behind him i wonder whether he'll pay hawkehurst a visit thought george as he bolted his door and he had a kind of grim satisfaction in the idea that valentine's christmas peace might be disturbed by the advent of that grisly visitor End of chapter nine read by celine major Book the Tenth, Chapter Ten of Charlotte's Inheritance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Celine Major. Charlotte's Inheritance by Mary Elizabeth Braden, Chapter Ten. According to their deeds. Between Wimbledon and Kingston, muttered the tramp, if I can drag myself as far as that i'll go there this night he went downstairs and out into the pitiless cold and snow and made his way down fetter lane and across blackfriars bridge to the surrey side of the water stopping to beg here and there upon this snowy christmas night there were plenty of people abroad and amongst them philip sheldon found pitying matrons who explored the depths of their capacious pockets to find him a halfpenny and good-natured young men who flung the copper he besought with piteous professional wine when he had collected the price of a glass of gin he went into the first public-house he came to and spent his money he was too ill to stay the cravings of his stomach with substantial food gin gave him temporary warmth and temporary strength and enabled him to push on vigorously for a little while and then came dreary periods of faintness and exhaustion in which every step was sheer pain and weariness something of his old self 
some remnant of that hard strength of purpose which had once characterized him remained with him still utterly fallen and brutalized as he was as a savage creature of the jungle might pursue a given course pushing always onward to that camp or village whence the scent of human flesh and blood was wafted to his quivering nostrils so philip sheldon pushed on towards the dwelling-place of that man and that woman whom of all creatures upon this earth he most savagely hated there is nothing left for me but to turn housebreaker he said to himself and the first house i'll try my hand upon shall be valentine hawkehurst's the idea of violence in such a creature was the idea of a madman weapon he had none nor the physical strength that would have enabled him to grapple with a boy of twelve years old half intoxicated with the spirits he had consumed on his long tramp half delirious with fever he had a vague notion that he could make an entrance into some ill-defended house under cover of night and steal something that should procure him food and shelter and let the house be valentine hawkehurst's the man who had baffled his plans and crushed him if blood must be shed let the blood be his never was man better primed for murder than the man who tramped across wimbledon common at eleven o'clock this night with the snow drifting against his face and his limbs shaken every now and then by an ague fit happily for the interests of society his hand lacked the power to execute that iniquity which his heart willed he reached a little wayside inn near the robin hood gate of richmond park just as the shutters were being closed and asked a man if any one of the name of hawkehurst lived in that neighbourhood what do you want with mr hawkehurst asked the man contemptuously i've got a letter for him have you a begging letter i should think from the look of you no it's a business letter you'd better show me where he lives if he's a customer of yours the business is particular is it you're a queer kind of messenger to trust with particular business mr hawkehurst's house is the third you come to on the opposite side of the way but i don't suppose you'll find anybody up as late as this their lights are out by eleven in a general way the third house on the opposite side of the road was half a mile distant from the little run lights shone bright in the lower windows as the tramp dragged his tired limbs to the stout oaken gate the gate was fastened only by a latch and offered no resistance to the intruder he crept with stealthy footsteps along the smooth gravel walk sheltered by dark laurels on which the light flashed cheerily from those bright windows sounds of laughter and of music pealed out upon the wintry air shadows flitted across the blinds of the broad bay windows philip sheldon crept into a sheltered nook beside the rustic porch and sank down exhausted in the shadow of the laurels he sat there in a kind of stupor he had lost the power of thought somehow on that dreary journey it seemed almost as if he had left some portion of his being out yonder in the cold and darkness he had difficulty in remembering why he had come to this place and what that deed was which he meant to do hawkehurst he muttered to himself hawkehurst the man who leagued against me with jed i swore to be even with him if ever i found the opportunity if ever and george refused me a few shillings my brother my only brother refused to stand my friend hawkehurst and george his only brother the images of these two men floated confusedly in his brain he could scarcely separate them sometimes it seemed to him that he was still sitting outside his brother's door on the staircase in gray's inn hugging himself in his rags and cursing his unnatural kinsman's cruelty then in the next moment he remembered where he was and breathed the bitter curses upon that unconscious enemy whose laugh pealed out every now and then amid a chorus of light-hearted laughter there was a little christmas party at charlottenborough two flies were waiting in the laurel avenue to convey mr hawkehurst's guests to distant abodes the door was opened presently and all the bustle of departure made itself heard by that wretched wayfarer who found it so difficult to keep his hold upon the consciousness of these things what is it he said to himself a party hawkehurst has been giving a party he had lived through too much degradation he had descended in too deep a gulf of wretchedness to be conscious of the contrast between his present situation and his position in those days when he had played the host 
and seen handsome carriages bear prosperous guests away from his door in that cycle of misery which he had endured these things and the memory of them had faded from him as completely as if they had been obliterated by the passage of a century the hapless wretch tried to give sustained attention to all the animated discussion that attended the departure of the merry guests half a dozen people seemed to be talking at once valentine was giving his friends counsel about the way home you will keep to the lower road you know fred Lossley's cab can follow yours you came a couple of miles out of your way and tell that fellow battersea bridge is a mistake and then followed charlotte's friendly questioning about wraps and hoods and comforters and other feminine gear and when are you coming to dine at fulham cried one voice i shall certainly get those quadrilles of offenbachs said another how delightfully mr Lossley sang that song of santley's and anon a chorus of never enjoyed myself more most delightful evening pray don't come out in the cold thanks well yes yours are always capital no i won't light up till i'm on the road give my book a lift in the d h eh old fellow are you quite sure that shawl is warm enough take a rug for your feet thanks no good night see you on tuesday don't forget the box for d l all right old fellow lower road roehampton lane putney bridge good night among the confusion of voices philip sheldon had recognized more than one voice that was familiar to him there were charlotte's gentle tones and valentine's hearty baritone and another that he knew diana paget yes it was her voice diana paget whom he had cause to hate for her interference with his affairs a beggar he muttered to himself and the daughter of a beggar she was a nice young lady to set herself in opposition to the man who gave her a home the vehicles drove away but there was still a little group in the rustic porch valentine and charlotte with monsieur and madame lenoble who had come to spend their christmas with their english friends how we have been gay this evening cried gustave there is nothing like your english interior for that which you call the comfortable the jolly you others thy friends are the jollity itself hawkehurst and our acting charades when that we all talked at once and with such emphasis on the word we would make to know was it not that our spectators were cunning to divine the words and your friend lastly it is a mixture of got and sanson it is a true genius think then diane while we were amusing ourselves our girls were at the midnight mass at the sacre coeur dear pious children their innocent prayers ascended toward the heavens for we who are absent come madame hawkehurst diane it makes cold but we are sheltered here and the stars are so bright after the snow said charlotte do you remember the christmas day you spent at the lawn valentine when we walked in kensington gardens together just when we were first engaged the young wife added shyly do i not remember it was the first time the holiness of christmas came home to my heart and now let us go back to the drawing-room and sit round the fire and tell ghost stories the noble shall give us the legends of cote noir valentine murmured charlotte do you know that it is nearly one o'clock and we must put in an appearance at church to-morrow morning and le noble has to walk to kingston to early mass we will postpone our ghost stories to new year's eve and le noble shall read tennyson's new year to demonstrate his improvement in the english language lead the way mrs hawkehurst your obedient slave obeys mamma is waiting for us in the drawing-room marvelling at our delay no doubt and nancy woolper stalks ghost-like through the house oppressed by the awful responsibility of to-morrow's pudding anon came a clanking of bolts and bars and philip sheldon for the second time that night heard a door shut against him as the voices died away his consciousness of external things died with him he fancied himself on the gray's inn staircase don't be so hard upon me george he muttered faintly if my own kith and kin turn against me whom shall i look to mrs woolper opened the door early next day when night was yet at odds with morning 
all through the night the silent snowflakes had been falling thick and fast and they had woven the shroud of philip sheldon the woman who had watched his infant slumbers forty years before was the first to look upon him in that deeper sleep of whose waking we know so little it was not until she had looked long and closely at the dead face that she knew why it was that the aspect of that countenance had affected her with so strange a pang she did recognize that altered wretch and kept her counsel before the bells rang for morning service the tramp was lying in the dead house of kingston union whither he had been conveyed very quietly in the early morning unknown to any one but the constable who superintended the removal and the servants of mr hawkehurst's household only the next day did ann woolper tell valentine what had happened there was to be an inquest it would be well that some one should identify the dead man and establish the fact of philip sheldon's decease valentine was able to do this unaided he attended the inquest and made arrangements for the outcast's decent burial and in due course he gave mrs sheldon notice of her freedom beyond that nameless grave whose fancy shall dare follow philip sheldon he died and made no sign and in the last dread day when the dead small and great from the sea and from the grave pressed together at the foot of the great white throne and the books of doom are opened when above shines the city whose light is the glory of god and below yawns the lake of fire what voice shall plead for philip sheldon what entreating cry shall pity send forth that sentence against him may be stayed surely none unless it issue from the lips of that one confiding friend whose last words upon earth thanked and blessed him and whose long agonies he watched with unshaken purpose conscious that in every convulsive change in the familiar face and every pang that shook the stalworth form he saw the result of his own work perhaps at that dread judgment day when every other tongue is silent the voice of tom halliday may be heard pleading for the man who murdered him end of chapter ten recorded by celine major end of charlotte's inheritance by mary elizabeth braden